Hi, everyone. My name is Marie Chevrier, and I'm really excited to be here today to present to you moving from selling a product to selling a brand experience. Very excited to have you all here today. And if you wanted to share anything today on social about this webinar, please do using the hashtag experience first and also using our company's name at Stampler Business. So really excited today to talk about moving from selling a product to selling an experience because it's a subject that's actually quite dear to, to our heart here at Sampler and really the big reason that we started the company. So a little bit about me. So as I said, I'm the founder of a company called Sampler and what we do is we help brands digitize product sampling. I spent pretty much my entire career in marketing technology and I'm really excited to share some insight about what I've seen has changed in the retail space and consumer packaged goods space and why we think that experiences are going to become the next way of marketing. So when it comes to selling a product, what we found is that experiences is the best way to sell your product. Because if you really think about it for a minute, when you ask a consumer why they're buying your product, or when you ask a brand manager what makes their product so special, they typically will answer with something like, it's the touch, it's the taste, maybe it's the way that it feels or its effect or maybe it's even the way that the product smells, right? So it's always about these physical experiences that make people feel a certain way. In some cases too, it's just the way a brand makes us feel or the way a brand makes us feel part of something. And that is a really, really special thing to capture. And unfortunately, many of the brands that we've grown up with have actually been based on other things than, than experience. They were all about creating good products that really had wide appeal. And ultimately the formula was just to get it distributed to as many people as possible in the most cost-effective way. And not really thinking about the entire way that a consumer is actually consuming and behaving around your product. And I mean, it makes sense because in the old days, or I guess at the old days, I mean, in, in, in not so long ago, all a brand needed to really worry about is their distribution. And they severely relied on the retailer to be creating the in-store experience. The household brands that we grew up really, really never sold on a direct-to-consumer model and never in their wildest dreams did they even imagine that they would be selling one bottle of ketchup directly to a consumer's home. And ultimately, that made them not need to worry about the experience and the way that things were delivered. And obviously, that's until giants like Amazon made ordering products easier than ever. And all of a sudden, consumers had the most convenient channels at their fingertips, making it possible for them to make more impulsive decisions without necessarily relying on the distribution of their local retailers. And then the space got even more complicated, right? What ended up happening is that our shelves, our, our retailer shelves got fragmented. If I just go to the experience of buying peanut butter in store, I, I now have so many types of peanut butters to pick from, whether it's a cashew butter, an almond butter, a butter, the choices are really endless. And so because the consideration set becomes so much larger, brands have to stand out by creating meaningful connections and meaningful experiences. Another big thing that happened is all this, these great companies that have come out like Dollar Shave Club, they came into the market and created, uh, they created a unicorn. And ultimately, the only thing they did is they made a very, very simple promise that they would be both cheap and convenient. And that's, that's really because they understood that the consumer, they didn't really care about 
how how many blades a, a shaver has. All they cared about was how quickly and efficiently they could get it to them and also do it at a low cost. And so the experience in which the product was delivered became quickly more important than the product that they were delivering. And obviously that has certainly surprised many people in that category. And it's, and it's, a, there's a lot to learn from that. With all these quick examples, it's very clear to us that today products are only one quarter of what you sell. And I'm sure that you feel that way too, as a marketer today, again, products will be in the future, just a very small portion of what you sell. Consumers today are looking for things that are more than your product. They're, they're buying things like values, they're buying convenience, they're buying performance, they're buying personalization, exclusivity, lifestyle. And these are all things that you have to deliver in the way that you are going to market with your product in a way that you're distributed in, in many different places. And so, one of the questions I was going to ask in order to start the conversation and make sure that, that we're all reviewing uh, on the same page is just seeing which of these uh, attributes do you think really drive your product forward or the, pro or the brands that you work with. So if you go to the quick poll right now, you'll be able to answer and tell us which, which of these things your brand takes into account. So we're getting some votes in. Thanks for, for voting. So we'll close the poll and we'll show you the quick results. So as you can see, most of us have found that performance is still the largest driver of why consumers buy your product. And after that, we see, we see that values are becoming really important. We definitely see a tie across convenience, personalization and exclusivity. But one of the things that we really have to talk about here if, if, with performance being the top contender here is that the only way that you're going to be able to showcase performance is by having a consumer experience your product, especially if your product is a cosmetic product or something which, which needs to be tried multiple times, you're going to need to get them to experience it several times before they see the performance. Let's keep going and, and look through some of the examples. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go through a couple examples that show that physical retail isn't dead and, and ultimately boring retail experiences are and ultimately how we can reinvent the way we go to market with experiences. So when it comes to one of the attributes that we know consumers are looking for, is one of the things is personalization. And I just absolutely love this St. Eve's experience where St. Eve's actually launched a pop-up experience in Soho, New York, that actually allowed consumers to mix their own scrubs and lotions. In this example, actually, St. Eve's has shown that personalization is quite important. They allowed consumers to customize a, pro a product that's normally the same across drugstore shelves and make it their own. So they came to the mixing bar and they got the opportunity to select the, the ingredients that they wanted in their product. And then they were paired with a member of staff who was actually able to educate them on the product and ultimately allow them to create a pack that had the consumer's name directly on it. Well, it was really interesting. It was actually reported that the company sold 10,000 products at $14 a scrub. So this means that the pop-up store for St. Eve's actually drove nearly four times more than the average cosmetic store in the U.S. does in the same period of time. So not only was this a really good way for the brand to actually collect data, because the brand was as actually was able to collect over 25,000 emails, but they were also able to show that this is also a really good way to, to drive sales. And so this is a great example of how you can do on a small scale testing with your customers on personalization. Another great example of personalization is Madi Face. This one is definitely no stranger to delivering high value experiences. The, the company that is behind this is L'Oreal. L'Oreal obviously is a global beauty brand and they shocked everyone when they decided to acquire the, their first technology company in March 2018. 
The Toronto-based startup had done some serious wave in augmented reality, but for the beauty industry, it really, really changes the way that you're shopping for makeup. What this allows the consumer to do with this virtual try-on experience is to test out different hair colors or makeup colors live while they're shopping on a shopping site. It's really becoming super important for brands to think about how they're going to sell their product and also offer services that really bring their product to life. And I think this is a really, really great example. Another example of personalization is actually with Tiffany & Co. And with Tiffany & Co, what they did is they did a pop-up in London's Convent Garden. And what they did is they allowed consumers to customize their different jewelry. And what was really interesting too is that consumers could go and actually select a, a sample from this great vending machine after leaving a little bit of information. Other examples include also Coca-Cola that came out with this end of aisle unit that actually allowed consumers consumers to create their own pack. So their own pack is being created by selecting different types of Coca-Cola products, but not forcing the customer to actually be picking only Coca-Cola. They can add a Fanta, then they can do a mellow yellow. And that I thought was pretty cool execution that can be done in retail. All right, so other examples of experiences. This one is around value. So this is an example from Google. And basically Google has created the impact challenge that allowed consumers on the in an out of home activation to actually vote for the charity that they wanted to give a donation to. So basically the Google impact challenge was going to give $5 million to Bay area nonprofits, no matter what, but they really decided to crowdsource the vote by putting an out of home activation right there. Another example of an experience, but this time that's driving exclusivity, is our work with Love Beauty Planet. As we talked in the beginning, people feel like they they love being part of something special. And one way to really drive exclusivity is to have a pre-launch event for your product. And so when Love Beauty Planet, which is a Unilever brand, actually came to market, they allowed the product to soft launch on Sampler by offering the consumer the choice to try their product. What was really cool is that the throughout the process of claiming a, a sample, the consumer was actually answering quick questions about their hair type, about their hair color, and it really felt like this really cool kind of BuzzFeed type quiz, but ultimately at the end of it, they were actually giving the brand some deep information about their hairstyles. And then ultimately in the end, the brand was able to follow up and ask some feedback back from the consumer. And that feedback helped the brand in identifying exactly who was going to react super well to their product while in market. So Beauty Brand Glossier has also really been a really amazing example of creating a lifestyle experience. A lifestyle experience can mean many things. So for Glossier in this concept store, they worked with designer studio Lily Kwong to create a pop-up in Seattle that was filled with greenery. And what was really, really special about this is that it was really a store designed for Seattle. So Glossier has pretty minimalistic branding, but when they entered Seattle, they really wanted the store to really, really match the love for nature that consumers in Seattle have. And you really could feel that in, in their store. And so sometimes it could be very specific and personalized to the market that you're in. Similarly, we saw a similar example of lifestyle from the team at Allbirds, the San Francisco-based shoe brand that's made a huge splash by selling shoes on Instagram. They too were artists to create a bit of an indoor-outdoor feel for their launch in London. And using London parks and iconic architecture as an, as an inspiration, they were really able to create this amazing feel in their store. And consumers, as you know, can buy all birds online. So it was really more about showcasing the lifestyle in, in store and then having consumers go back to the online store to purchase. 
We talked about performance earlier and we talked about the fact that sometimes performance can be hard to, to really, really highlight in an advertisement. And certainly sometimes it requires a little bit of trial in order to be able to drive performance. Well, we all know that Nike's shoes is definitely a performance shoe. It's, it's definitely positioned itself as a high performance shoe. And although Nike expects that 30% of their sales will start being done uh, online by 2023, they still value their in-store physical retail experience because of, the, of that mere fact that consumers need to try the shoes before they buy. And what's really unique about this experience is that Nike has found that adding treadmills to their dressing rooms has been an amazing way to actually get consumers to test the performance while they're there and to really see the difference that they'll have in that shoe when working out. And I thought that was actually a really great way of bringing the situation in the dressing room. Convenience is another reason that people buy. It's another, it's another huge driver of, that will influence my experience with your brand. And certainly retailers have been struggling with the digitization of, of, their, of their channels and, and ultimately with adapting to e-commerce. And it's not always easy to create delivery channels that deliver fresh, but we've seen some amazing partnership for convenience with Kroger actually partnering with Ocado. Ocado is actually the largest distributor of grocery in Europe. But Kroger, a very American company, actually partnered with them in delivering convenience. And so, so I guess that's another, that's another learning is sometimes we can't be experts in everything and it's okay to partner with somebody else in order to deliver on these experience promise. So we talked about some great examples of how you might be able to drive some of these great experience points with your customers. We talked about how we could drive more convenience, some examples about personalization, some great examples about performance. But how? If you today are thinking about, I need to start thinking about delivering an experience, how should I start figuring out what the right experience should be? And so the first thing we'll do is we'll want to start with who. Who are we going to be serving with this experience? You have to be really critical on that. Start with the fact that only 10% of consumers probably care about your product. And that within that, that 10% at most, there's probably only 1% of those people who cannot live without your product, who would really want to go as deep as, as having that level of experience with you. A great example of that is Casper. When it came to Casper, the main thing that the founders realized is that they had been sold the concept that a mattress should fit the way that someone sleeps. So basically there's a, there's a mattress for everybody, firm mattresses for people that sleep on their back. There's, there's other types of mattresses for people that sleep on their stomach. But they, they really realized that at the end of the day, the must have of the key customer of Casper was nothing like that. The person that Casper customers were was a person that really didn't need their, their mattress to be like a cotton ball or as, or as hard as a shiny diamond. They just wanted a good mattress, a all around good mattress. And that was their concept. The concept was a, a good mattress that's good enough for everyone. That understanding of who their customer is really, really drove the way that they created experiences for these people. You have to build product experiences that really focus on that consumer. And if we think of what it was for Casper, it was about convenience, simplicity, and making the entire experience of buying a mattress easy peasy. And so the founders actually spent probably a lot of time developing the mattress, but most of their time was actually about finding the way that that mattress could fit in this box that you see on that screen. That box is the same size or a bit smaller as you could see than a refrigerator. 
And so all they wanted to do is condense the entire ordering experience into a small box and making delivery easier for that consumer. Because if you think about it, the consumer who is currently wanting just a mattress that's just good enough, that is great, but not too complex, they live in a small apartment. They're probably sitting in Manhattan right now and trying to get a mattress up the stairs of a 10 floor walk up, I can tell you by my own experience, is not easy. And the way that they deliver their mattress is actually almost more valuable to that consumer than the mattress itself. What's really interesting too is that consumers who are ordering Casper are actually beginning to be part of a, of a group. They are sharing their mattress on social media. We've seen so many people sharing pictures of their Casper mattress. Can you ever imagine yourself sharing a picture of your mattress? The mattress category has been one of the most, you know, dormant categories when it comes to social sharing. And they completely changed that because they made the experience of delivering it that special. And there's a, a lot of other examples of amazing experiences. Here's BarkBox, the subscription box that's actually just for your dog. Every single month, consumers and their pets receive a themed box. And in this case, you could see in this example, the pet is actually receiving Jurassic pork. <laughs> so the entire experience is themed to Jurassic Park. And ultimately, the whole time when you're opening this box, the, the experience plays into the consumer's emotions because the box and the letter within the box is actually includes a little note that, that says, Dear Casper, here's your monthly box. So as you can see, it's really playing into the consumer's emotions. And then always start and end with who so we started with who but then you really really want to continue listening your assumptions on who might be the right consumer and what the right experience might not be the right one and so you really want to make sure that you continue to listen and go from there so those are my five different best practices for starting to build an experience. And we've certainly shared a lot of different ideas on how you might start. So I'd love to see if there's anyone that had any questions about some ideas or anything. We're here to, to answer. So we got one question. How could we deliver an experience with Sampler? So I, I actually quickly showed an experience thanks for asking that's a great question <laughs> we did share an example here of how sampler worked with love beauty planet where what they wanted to do is create a really exclusive program that allowed consumers to claim a free product sample before the actual product went live and we felt that you know this was a really really well done campaign because we were able to very much target the people that they thought we they were going after within the market and create a quiz that really that really fit the personality of that consumer. And ultimately the brand was able to actually find some cohort of consumers within that wider group that were way more engaged with the with the product. And I think that they they left with a lot of really, really great insights on, on who they should continue to be betting on. I'll, I'll thank you so much for your time. We hope that we gave you some, some really good ideas on how you might be building experiences. And as a reminder, when you're building your experiences, remember that those experiences should be built on highlighting some of these things that consumers are buying that are not products anymore, they are experiences. And that's things like values, convenience, performance, personalization, exclusivity, and lifestyle. Thank you so much and have a super day. We'd love you to share on social. Sorry, I'm going back and forth, but I'm going to, uh, to share our, our uh, contact information. And uh, again, wish you a really, really great day.